The phrase Spaceship Earth is commonly used today, indicating greater global consciousness. Its author, Buckminster Fuller, is our guest today. He is known throughout the world for his innovations and insight into our universal existence. You will learn that your future is not the bleak, frightening devastation painted by the doom sellers, but rather an incredibly exciting blend of energy and resources, the yellow brick road to greater awareness and creativity. Welcome to Psychic Phenomena of the World Beyond. I am your host, Damian Simpson, and we will be in conversation in the next hour with Buckminster Fuller. Welcome. I have been so excited about interviewing you that I must explain to my audience so they'll understand me in the next hour. I feel like a kid in a candy store. After reading your material, you know so much about so many things. And in reading your biography, I read that at the age, I believe it was 32, that you decided to do your own thinking. Would you explain that a little bit, what brought that about? <coughs> well, in my childhood and my school days, the older people from way, way back showed that they were <coughs> confidently convinced that the celebration of young people was absolutely unreliable. My father died when I was quite young, and my mother would say, Darling, never mind what you think. Listen, we're trying to teach you. And she sacrificed a great deal to send me to what she felt was a good school. It did rank very highest, really Harvard's highest scholarship preparatory school. And uh, there they t said, Never mind, young man, what you think. Listen, we're trying to teach you. And all my contemporaries were being convinced that that was so. And because our thoughts were often quite different from what we were being taught, we assumed that we were just sort of freaks. That we had to live with ourselves. And so I, I saw that there was also we were being taught that whereas we had, our grandmothers had told us all about the uh, golden rule and very lovely ways to behave and and you'd enjoyed your sensitivity as a child, just looking at the flowers. We were being taught, you've got to get over your sensitivity. Life is tough. Mm -hmm. and it's not enough to go around. You're going to have to deprive somebody else. You're going to have to be selfish. There was a game, apparently, that you're going to have to play. Because I knew how much my mother loved me, and I, I felt, these, felt my teachers, my friends, and they were all telling me, never mind what I thought. I tried very hard to play the game and not pay attention to what I thought. I, I did a, uh, my particular group, lifetime group, but, but I came into Harvard in 1913, in the class of 1917. Out of 700 in that class, only 45 were there for graduation because everybody was off in the war, World War I. So it was, it was a, I did very well in the Navy. I, I learned a game, and so uh, they had a game that was even better spelled out than the everyday business world. And so I did very well, and I didn't have to. I got to have several commands and had some very high responsibility positions, but I didn't have to make money with my boat. All I did was run my boat well. Mm -hmm. So when I came out of the Navy, <coughs> and I, I, was, I had gotten into the qualified and became a regular United States line officer, USN. And our first child born during World War I got spinal meningitis and then infantile paralysis, and we had to fight for her life until she died on her fourth birthday. Just before she died, they, I was ordered to the Asiatic Station, and the, I couldn't leave my child, so they let me resign from the Navy. I came out of the Navy, and because I had done very well in it, because I had gone to school with rich boys, and then Harvard rich boys, even though my family were not rich. I found that my rich friends wanted to back me when they found I, I would like to go into the building world when I got out of the Navy. And I did get, get five factories going to producing materials for these buildings, and uh, I did get 240 buildings up between 1922 and 1927. It was in 1922 that our first daughter died, and so the years of really tremendous sorrow, and I was working terribly hard to do a good job 
and I would work very hard all day, drink hard at night, and uh, came then to 1927, and our second child was born all absolutely healthy. And that was a very extraordinary moment. And just at that moment, I got to the point where I had lost all my friends' money. They had all backed me. And I'd gotten up some good buildings, but I, I just couldn't get around to making money. Hmm. I, 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 just, I was going to cheat somewhere if I was going to make money. I wanted to get a good building up. And so I not only lost all my money, but I lost all the backing of my friends. I was in disgrace, so I was penniless, and here was this new child born. And as far as I could see, I never would like to get on with that game of making money. That I could get on with the Navy thing, but I couldn't get on with it. With it making money game. And I just didn't have have that hard, hard thing you really needed to suddenly do the other fellow. And uh, so I said, I think I better do away with myself. Or if you're going to do away with yourself, you better do some thinking about it. And up this time, I've always said, never mind. I've been taught, never mind what I think. Learn the game. And I said, the game has turned out to be one I can't get on with. Therefore, I might as well do some thinking about it, <laughs> right, and, and if it seems proper, then do away with yourself because you're, you're going to be disgraced to your family and your mother and your wife's family could probably get on better with the, your, the, them as dependents than I was doing. And uh, so when I started with my own thinking, this is 1937, I was 32. That's the point you ask about. Mm -hmm. And it, it became a very extraordinary matter, matter to suddenly do your own thinking, realizing how many times what I had been thinking was happening in the society, which society didn't think was happening, how many times I'd really been right. Yeah. And so I began to, that gave me some courage to think about my, my own, doing my own thinking. I said if I'm going to do my own thinking, I'm going to have to give up all the things I've been taught to believe, all the loyalties, all the things you, you take on, just take on because that's part of the game. And by the word belief, I then said, I mean, accepting explanations of physical phenomena without any experimental evidence. Mm -hmm. Just because somebody else said it's so, and you said, you know, I love you, and, and uh, I'm telling you what's right. Mm -hmm. So I said, if I'm going to give up all, all my beliefs and so forth, I'm going to have to go entirely on my own experience. And I began to review experience, and one of my experiences certainly was that uh, having learned a game, that there was a whole patois, there was a set of cliches that go along with the game. And somebody says, says hi, and you say hi. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a parrot game, a conditioned reflexes. So probably the first thing I better do is to set up a, a moratorium on speech, not allow myself to just yield to conditioned reflexes, be sure I really know what I'm doing when I use the sound because word tools are extraordinarily powerful, and yet they just use time and again to deceive one another. <coughs> so I must really understand speech itself. And so I went in for pretty much of a moratorium. I couldn't make a complete one because there were necessities of my wife and child that would, from time to time, have to speak. But my wife tried to cooperate by doing all the things that she could talk to the butcher or answer the telephone, whatever it might be. So we were penniless, and... This brought me to, a, to the realization that all my contemporaries were committed to how to earn a living. And I said, I think that's, they said, no matter whether you like it or not, you hope you'll earn it in the way you like, but at any rate, you've got to earn a living. I said, I think we ought to be looking into what needs to, be, what's my experience teach me needs to be done which, if attended to properly, can bring success for all humanity, and if left unattended, might find all humanity in, a, in, in, a, in real trouble. What are the things that nobody else is attending to? Because they're too big. I saw all the great nations, all the political systems were dividing up, 150 nations are dividing up about one-eighth of the earth, which was propitious for support of life. They were looking out for themselves, Nobody's looking out for the total spaceship Earth. So I then committed myself and said, I've been captain of ships, I'm going to, this when I invented the word spaceship Earth. And I like to look on the fact that for some reason or other, humans have been invented and they've been put on the spaceship. 
and what, here are the resources and this is the cumulative know-how. How do we use that know-how to take care of all the people on board in a proper manner? I'm so overwhelmed by the designing competence of universe that can design a human being where you and I haven't the slightest idea how to design ourselves. And I'm so overwhelmed by the, by the phenomenon of gravity or radiation or that we're getting our life support from the sun 92 million miles away. All this thing is so overwhelmingly exciting when you began to do your own thinking that it really launched me on a, a, on a pattern where I found myself in a 50-year, half-century commitment to, if possible, employ the advanced science which is going only into weaponry to do more with less so that you might sometime take care, do so much with so little you might be able to take care of everybody and make all the politics invalid. What they have always had the working assumption it has to be you or me. And that's why Russia, United States, for instance, last 30 years spending over 200 billion a year on how to destroy them most expertly. Do more with less is, is the key word I hear from you. It just sounds like a man who finds himself caught up in a cage. You know, I, I understand the conditioning, the schooling, and to break loose in free thinking. And the audience might know that we're talking to a man who has innumerable honorable degrees. I've spoken to just about every major university in the world and college and every organization whose picture has been on the cover of Times Magazine, People in the New Yorker. So we're really talking to a man who dared think for himself and his thinking has affected the world and will continue to affect it for, for time to come. We'll be right back after the following message. Stay with us. You started by saying that you wanted to commit it, commit your life as it is now to humanity, to making the planet a better place to live. I want to go back to the first segment where you state that word, you, you did not speak unless you were spoken to and you answered what you were asked. This, this became, made you aware of the power of your word. I would imagine, um, I spent some time, so you would understand me, in a cloistered monastery where one does not speak, there's no radio, there's no television, there's no communication with the outside world. And the minute one stops communication with the outside world, communication with the inner world begins. Now it is very difficult for the monastery I was in to be aware of the fact that I was communi communicating with an inner world with ideas and thoughts that did not fit, as you said, the game pattern. Okay, in the building industry that you were in, now that you are coming forward, doing your own thinking, because as you said here, obviously you had nothing to lose, you were penniless. The point is whether you should take your life or not. Um, every man that I've interviewed or woman that I totally respected have always faced that experience of taking their own life. And I would even admit to including myself. There comes a point where you deal with the world, you know the world's thinking, you cannot relate to the experiences within the world, and it's either better to either play the game or get out of the game. But that always seems to bring a rebirth experience, a, a reborn experience again. Um, I think scriptures say, be born again by the renewal of your mind. Would it be fair to say that of you, that you were born again from this period by the renewal of your mind, bringing forth your own thinking, your own innovations? I say that as a retrospective statement. Mm -hmm. At the time, I said the only validation of my not doing away with myself would be to turn all my experience entirely over to others and not ever again work for me. Mm -hmm. If you're really going to be thorough about that. But that is what I want to be so thorough really about. So it's really a powerful commitment. Yes, because there's where a lot of people today, Mr. Fuller, do not understand what they can do with their life and have no reason for existence. I, I, and I think that in the simplicity of your statement, you're telling people what to do that don't know what to do, is to, if you're going to keep on living, then turn your life over to the benefit of humanity. Turn it over to some good. There were complications that go beyond what you're saying here, or just making a commitment. Mm -hmm. Number one, I was 32. The life insurance companies prognostication for individuals, males born in 1895 when I was, was 42 years of age. That was life expectancy. I was 32, so I only had 10 years to go by mm -hmm. the average. 
And I said, what can a little individual do in 10 years with almost with 3 billion human beings on our planet? <laughs> Obviously, I'm not going to get anywhere asking people to listen to me. That's just exactly when they don't listen. That's one of the things I really have learned. Mm -hmm. Only way I think I can ever be effective on behalf of human beings is that if you're doing your own thinking, to realize the way you and I are designed, the way you and I behaved, is completely the consequence of the environment we find ourselves in. We're in a biosphere. Mm -hmm. The biosphere on this particular planet. All <coughs> organic biological systems are average 50% water. Human beings are 60% water. Water freezes and boils <laughs> within very small limits. If you went outside of our biosphere, you'd immediately freeze to death or burn up. <laughs> so I said, the way we behave is then this environmental control, and we eat these things because they're available. <laughs> we don't invent them. We breathe this air because it's available. <laughs> and so I said, any way in which you and I alter using principles that are operative in the universe, which our minds are able to discover, as for instance the lever, where suddenly one man can lift what took 20 men to lift before, <laughs> where you can do a whole lot for others with the scientific principle. With whatever extent I employ principles which are operative in the universe to alter the environmental conditions for humanity, to make it more favorable for the survival of humanity, this would make, bring about a spontaneous behavior if I build a bridge where there's a roaring gorge, where there's life support on the other side of the roaring gorge, and people have been risking their lives trying to swim across the gorge to get mm -hmm. what society... If I build a bridge, I don't have to say anything. Everybody just uses the bridge. So that I would commit myself then to producing artifacts and not trying to reform the human beings, but to, re to take part in nature's own evolutionary reforming of her own environment by virtue of using these tools. So I was then committing myself to try to do something for all humanity in 10 years with tools and not by any political persuasion. I was completely apolitical. I said, all right, this means then I'm going to need a great deal of capital capability, machinery, resources to produce the tools and then certainly in quantities that are going to affect all humanity. <coughs> I have absolutely no money. <coughs> There's nobody to tell me to do what I see. <coughs> How am I going to be able to get on? I'm penniless. I've got a dependent wife and child, which means you're going to eat tomorrow. I'm immediately in need of food. So I said, all right, what I see from doing my own thinking is the following, that the animals don't have any money, <laughs> and the sun and the wind don't have any money. That money is some kind of invention of humans. And I see that all of ecology on board of our planet is intersupportive. And the universe itself, by the best we know in physics, is eternally regenerative, 100% efficient. That what goes on in our little planet must be in support of the eternal regeneration of the greater universe itself. So I said, I see ecology is interregenerative. And it could be that if I understood what human beings are here for on our planet, what we're supposed to be doing in the local universe, if I were then to undertake to support and make that a success, to make the human beings a success themselves, to get rid of the has to be you or me earning a living idea, get that out of the way. If I could commit myself to that effectively, it might be that nature would support me just the way she has the the hummingbird supporting this, little, this other little nest and so forth. I, so it needs then a commitment to doing a big task on a working assumption of absolute faith in the integrity of the universe itself. And there's a, there's a greater intelligence operating in the universe than that of human beings. And that if you'll commit yourself to a faith in that, you may find you can get on. But somebody has to make an experiment, and you, you're ideal for it because you are panelists and you do have the dependence. So my wife was game to try it, so this is what we did commit ourselves. So that's now 52 years ago, and I have been able to get, I have over 200,000 geodesic domes around the world today. I've gotten out a great many books. I've been able to produce a lot, a lot of artifacts, a better way of seeing the Earth and a better world map, things like that. And I've had to say that only, only the... the uh, the impossible happens. 
I've, I've been up against miracle after miracle. Just when I need things at the critical moment, just the last critical moment, then I have what I need. It's been a, so I've, this is sort of appropriate kind of a information to come on your kind of a program where we're really talking about some of the great mysteries of, of the universe. So to me, I have then found apparently doing what needs to be done. When I was not doing what needed to be done, when I was doing the wrong thing, I would come in against a, a, a stone wall and we would not be successful. When I was doing the right things, so I'm continually having to use my intuition to say, which is the right thing if I stop here or I, maybe I should have been going over here. What is the high priority action today, the next hour, the next minute? So I've had to make a great many mistakes and, and learn when you're coming to the end of this particular tack of your ship and, and going to have to come about, go on another tack. I think that's, that would be the very essence of, of what you would be interested in, in in talking with somebody like myself. I hear you, you talk about faith as a prerequisite for free thinking. I, I cannot tell you how much I am impressed with just that idea because we all consider ourselves free thinkers. We all like to think we're free thinkers and we don't know why it doesn't work for us. Obviously it has worked for you. But what you are saying that you had to build yourself on faith and I want to just reiterate that because it just went by so quickly but it was so profound that how the universe does look after itself, each after its kind and it was that faith that you had to still upon that rock, then you can do your free thinking and bring forth something constructive. The other thing that I want to point out for my audience in this segment that I want to pull out of what you're saying is the ability to alter your course without losing your faith. Because when many people have to alter the course of their th structured thinking, because even free thought can get structured after a while. You can caught up in your own structure of your own free thought. But you seem to have the ability to even alter your course without losing your faith. Well, I, uh, what I had to continually realize when I was in trouble, and, the, and my trouble tended to say, tend to me trouble, mm -hmm. uh, I said, who am I? I don't know anything. I've got to learn over and over again that you're nobody. You are something, that human beings are something very extraordinary in themselves, but I'm not anything, I'm, but I'm the one committed. There's a function in the universe to be performed this moment in history, so stop the idea that you have, you're up to you to solve these problems. Commit yourself to faith that it will be. <coughs> so it's continually yielding that you want, uh, your, <coughs> what seems to be big to you is not really big, mm -hmm. and really to yield to the bigger need. And mm -hmm. don't be preoccupied with the negative. Be preoccupied with, with the, the constructive. The alternatives. But you have to do that on absolute faith that just everything's going to come out all right. Mm -hmm. Forget the trouble. Go to work. A lot, of, a lot of people say today, we have one minute. A lot of people say today that we're headed for the end. We're out of oil. We're out of everything. And as we said in the beginning of the show, there are these uh, doom sellers. Um, I would be so bold to make a statement, not to put that statement on you, but religion has become a billion dollar business on televangelism in this country selling doom. And yet you're a man, as a free thinker, sees a wide, wide world ahead of excitement, of energy, of new life, of new birth, of everything coming that's exciting. So your message must be more important now than ever. One of the most important things uh, in my commitment was that I've never become the head of a cult that I must always just remember, it's just a little me. I'm, uh, not, I'm not a special messiah. Well, there you hear it. When a man, as you said, people will use the bridge if you don't tell them it's there. We're in conversation with Mr. Buck, Minister Fuller, and we'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to Psychic Phenomena of the World Beyond. I am Damian Simpson, and we are in conversation with Mr. Buck, Minister Fuller. Um, on the onset of the show, I was telling Mr. Fuller that all night I felt like I was a kid in a candy store with a penny, and here was this whole case of candy, because you have used your mind and your ability for free thinking to look into so many things, not only the universe, but on the way in the car, I was reading the paper that you were doing on uh, mammals and prehistoric man and how the family unit developed. and. I figured that when I was a kid in a candy store and after I paid my penny and I got the candy and I went outside and I tasted it, I always wished I had taken the other candy. You're the first person I talk to. It is not a disappointment. I spend my penny and you sure do deliver the candy. It's like eating a whole plate of fudge. I really, I, I want to just the audience to slow down for a minute 
to hear the philosophy, not only the philosophy, the psychology, the way of life that you're talking about, because you're relying on the ability as a self-totally created unit. I'd like to speak to you a moment about the domes, because the domes seem to be a very important part of at least your publicity or the for, the, what goes before you. Um, what brought about the construction of the geodesic dome and its importance to you? Well, I told you that I had committed myself to solving problems with artifacts and not by mm -hmm. social reforms or religious this, <coughs> rules. Mm -hmm. And so the, one of the commitments then was to employ the most advanced science that was only going into weaponry <coughs> in to prior to the home front to see if we couldn't do so much with so little in the environment of the of the life that uh, you might be able to take care of everyone and that did end up in, in the geodesic structures which do do vastly more in the way of environment control than any other form of structure in the universe in fact it's such an important form that you find the protein shell of all the viruses with the DNA RNA control of life are inside geodesic spheres mm -hmm. as a protein shell so nature is using this most for her most precious information control is using the, the geodesic. I didn't know that. I built a great many geodesic domes. They've been photographed, published a lot. And when I heard from a great scientist in England, Dr. Klug, who was at the Burbeck College of, in New London University, and he wrote me about having read and seen pictures of the geodesics, and he said he was investigating with, X, with the X-ray diffraction the protein shells of the viruses while these other people were going on with their discovering the, the DNA, RNA, and so forth. And he said that the mathematics of the X-ray diffraction photographs indicated they had some kind of nodes that were similar in their arrangement to a geodesic dome. So I was able to send, them, send him the, the, the numbers of the nodes would always be what they call frequency of modular subdivision of the total system to the second power times 10 plus the number 2. About five years later, the virologists had a world meeting in, in uh, America at, uh, down Long Island, and they published the front page of the New York Times the fact that my formula had explained the protein shells of all the viruses. But the point was I had found it mathematically how to structure, the, do the most with the least, and so it came out pure, pure logic that nature was also using the same thing, because I found it mathematically. Nature had the mathematics itself. Anyway, that's enough about that for the moment. The, that was the point. Hmm. And incidentally, about publicity, I've never had any publicity agents or anybody. I don't have any agents of any kind. Nobody's allowed to promote around me. Yet, in our archives in Philadelphia, we have over, during this 52 years of, of project, there are over 34,000 articles written about my work by somebody else, mm -hmm. which have just come naturally because what I was doing was attending to what needed to be done. I'd like to go back more right now to the what we were talking about a little earlier and the commitment to uh, of a, a human being as an experimental undertaking to see whether if you did what nature wanted done, you would find yourself getting on instead of doing what the system said you ought to do. Mm -hmm. And that I, because that had not been proven, I, and I have I'm now represent a 52-year demonstration that, that apparently it can be done. I'm not saying to anybody, you just peel off from the system I'm saying that you have to see something needs to be done that nobody else is attending to, mm -hmm. which is going to take a whole lifetime and commit yourself to it then. That's all right. Because the minute anybody else starts to do what I am doing, I walk away from that. All I want to be sure is being attended to. Mm -hmm. Now, also, I want to come back to that faith business because what I said to myself when I began to do this thinking and realize that if I was really committing myself and I would be supported by nature, and I was committing myself to trying to make human beings a success, I'd be in um, the great design of the universe itself. You would uh, and unwittingly come into knowledge that the very incredible and important, of utter importance, actually right in the universe's own problem solving. And so I said, can you be trusted as an individual if and when you begin to find uh, your to great knowledge and you begin to apply it to solving problems of humanity, are you, are you confident that when that happens, you won't suddenly be Mr. Big? Yeah. Can you really trust yourself to always remember you were just, you were a throwaway? The only reason you're doing this is you're a throwaway. 
<laughs> it's not you personally at all. You're demonstrating what any individual really could do if they're not overwhelmed by the system mm -hmm. and really uh, become completely inspired by the integrity of the greater regenerative universe itself. So I have, I, I, I really am glad to say here we are in the air, that I have found myself trustworthy, that I have not committed myself, allowed myself to, as I said earlier, be a cult leader and not, never, uh, never to get out of making money. Enormous amounts of money come my way today. I immediately, I don't never ever try to do anything about money making or saving it. All of it must go immediately back into research so that for the last 20 years I've been able to command enough credit to do about a quarter of a million dollars worth of research and development each year. That's, and that, that's when you're really knowing your way around, can be tremendously effective. So I've been able to get an enormous amount of technology real, realized mm -hmm. by virtue of, of this. I like very much being with you, and there was something I put in the, in the fourth part of my book, Synergetics, which is my discovery of nature's own coordinate system, which science is not using, and, and science is using very esoteric, very awkward and mathematical language that 99% of humanity can't understand, all on a mis mis assumption uh, that we are in a flat world going to infinity and x, y, z coordinates perpendicular, parallel, we're all logical, etc., etc. Nature is not doing that. She's doing things divergently in radiation, convergently in gravity. She grows this way. She doesn't go parallel and perpendicular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I have found it, and I did publish it, and forward of that I put the words, dare to be naive. And really, the thing that really makes it very pleasant being on a program with you, you really, I saw, really committed to being daring to be naive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the only way you'll ever learn anything. Mm -hmm. you, you made a, um, a statement in your book that you have to remember, I don't know if it's in your book, it's in my notes, that neither you nor I know anything about everything, that we really don't know all there is to know about anything. We much approach it that way. I, I like what you're saying about remembering you see, people get a cause, whether it's just within their family or whether it's within a community or whether it's in the world, and they forget that that cause was born out of not knowing what to do with themselves. And your statement, remember, that we're a throwaway and that, that I have to identify to that, you see, because I reached a point of my life where I have to say I was throwaway. And from that point, I began to build a life, and it's very hard not to become Mr. Big and to remember, wait a minute, you built this all out of you, who was throwaway, mm -hmm. and that keeps the humility down, which keeps the free thinking going. It's a very important statement. You, how old are you, may I ask you that? I'm 83. 83. I didn't do the mathematics when you were telling me it. I have old. now the capability to say certain things because I became a comprehensive student of what I called a world inventory of resources, human trends, and needs. Mm -hmm. and and I found that we were continually learning in an invisible world of alloys, an invisible world of electronics, how to do much more with much less, mm -hmm. to converse around the world with a little piece of apparatus, instead of having to go around a great ship. So keeping track of the, all the ways we do more with less and converting that into technology, particularly with the home environment, I was able to say 10 years ago, it is now clearly in evidence from an engineering design viewpoint that we're now using only proven technology, using only metals that have already been mined that are recirculating. Within a 10-year design revolution, we can have all humanity living the highest standard living anybody's ever known, during which, and this would be completely sustainable, because during that 10 years, we can phase out all for the use of fossil fuels and atomic energy. We can live entirely on our energy income. Now, you make a public statement like that and you get checked up. There are probably a thousand people checking me up very carefully some million people now pretty sure that I really know what I'm talking about. You spoke about dooms, dooms people. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know anything to be negative. You have to know a great deal to be, be positive. Now, I only am able to be positive because I am a technologist reducing things to practice. I actually have the structures out there and the maps out there. I now I then came to the most extraordinary realization that all the great governments, all the great religions, all the great businesses would find it devastating to the activity to have humanity a success. They're all predicated on man being an inherent failure. They're going to be suffering and so forth and comfort him and, go and follow your leadership. So I, 
even though I now know this can be done, whether we're going to be able to exercise this option is very touch and go. It's all going to depend on a new young world coming through. And that new young world, every child being born in the presence of less misinformation, more reliable information. And it is in love with love and love with the truth. And it may be able then to come through and exercise this option. In watching interviews recently on the air over great controversies of religious organizations, I heard um, heads of these organizations state that doomsday and gloom is what sells. And if they preached a liberal doctrine or, or freedom doctrine, that they would not collect the funds and they would not have the support. That liberals will not support liberals, but doomsday people seem to feel if they pay someone, they can buy their way out of it. You come along and say, in 10 years, we can enjoy this total freedom as a, well, maybe as a promise of an earth of peace. We are in conversation with Buckminster Fuller. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Psychic Phenomena of the World Beyond. We are in conversation with Mr. Buckminster Fuller. And during our break, you said that you would like to say something at the opening of this segment. Well, before I get to saying what I wanted to say, I have listened to your commercial, and, and uh, I'm usually very annoyed by commercials. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, and I saw that you felt it sort of was off our course. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't, because I think if humanity... I now know humanity has the option to make it on our planet, which means we'll, we'll be, come to a point where nobody's having to earn a living anymore. It does not have to be you or me. We're in for a new chapter of humanity in the universe. And it's going to be something very different to look at, and we will talk about that. But whether we, I think humanity is now in a, what I call a final exam as to whether we qualify to stay here. And I'm not talking about a, uh, political leaders. I'm not talking about our religious leaders, I'm talking about humanity mm -hmm. is having its final exam, whether each individual really is going to warrant humanity saying, you know, we as individuals are going to be able to do things. That's the thing that's really going on, where we have literacy, which was, 99, humanity was 90% illiterate when I was young. Today we're more than 90% literate. Everybody has a vocabulary. All humanity has always been born naked, helpless, ignorant, Hungry, thirsty, curious, having to learn by trial and error, having to invent words, how to compound our experiences or help one another, how to write them. But suddenly we've come to a point where there's enough information about humans and the universe. And the older people had made so many mistakes of interpretation of the significance. Where there is, for instance, today, humanity is still, though it knows we are on a sphere, knows that we are on a planet going around the sun. It is still thinking ge geocentrically. We still have the sun going around us. I've spoken to a number of scientific bodies. I've asked every scientific body I speak to, any scientist present who do not see the sun going down in the evening? No hands. I said, you're 500 years behind coordinating your own senses with your own knowledge. We're still we're living in the condition reflex of a flat earth, with a wide, wide world, still to say that, four corners of the earth, don't we? Mm -hmm. Still say up and down, which it goes along with the perpendicular, perpendicular to the same plane. Mm -hmm. All those words uh, manifest that humanity is now still celebrating hundreds and thousands of years behind our actual knowledge. So I see that no matter how the little individual is going to have the integrity, once you call this to attention, to stop using the words up and down. You're all using it. The right words are in, out, and around. You go into the moon, into the earth, into Mars. You go out as any direction. You, but you go out and in, not up and down. Mm -hmm. Now, just go outstairs. Just, just dare to say that for a week. Want the individual to say it, not to have some, some teacher in school. You yourself find out that this is so and dare to commit yourself to the truth as you find it. Mm -hmm. If humanity really gets to the point where it dares to do that, it has enough really good information, then we will probably pass our final exam. At the present moment, we are here clearly for our minds. Our capability to discover principles operating in the universe, which can only be mathematically expressed, such as Newton's discovery of the law of gravity and the interattraction of, of bodies, that the interattraction is varied as a second power of the arithmetical distances. You double the distance away, you reduce the interattraction as one quarter what it was, 
but there will always be attractiveness. This is our great gravity of our universe. So when you know these mathematical laws, human beings have this capability, no other phenomena has, of access to principles of the universe by which it is designed. We must be here for something very, very important. That's where mind must be in control to make up, and there's a dare go along with the truth that mind discovers. At the present moment, muscle and cunning are in control of human affairs. Muscle, cunning, greed, selfishness, look out for self. We paid, it's amazing, six weeks ago we have 75% of all the television sets in America looking at two men trying to smash their thinking machines. Mm -hmm. We paid those men over a million, a couple of millions of dollars to put on that kind of a show. Mm -hmm. If you and I are really putting some really important kind of knockouts on the ways in which humanity is not going to survive, we're not going to pay that kind of million. That's why mind is not in as yet control. If mind becomes in control, we'll exercise our option to make it. Mm -hmm. I noticed when you introduced me, you talked about the, up the yellow brick path. Mm -hmm. We were not going up a yellow brick path. Mm -hmm. We're going up an invisible path. All right. And, All right. It's, and it's an invisible path into a condition where what we learn, when you use the words in and out instead of up and down, you will then bring in the world of electronics where you learn you can tune in a program or tune it out. When you tune it out, it doesn't mean it's non-existent. When you get into in and out, you begin to get something quite new. In this room right now, and any room around the world, any place, there are over two million programs going on, any which you could tune in, tune in. The fact that you're not tuning in doesn't mean they're there, not there. This brings you really to the, the mystery, you really begin to understand something about life. The life is, is not the organic system. At 83, I've now consumed over a thousand tons of food, air, and water, which came temporarily in my hair and my skin, got brushed off. I'm not yesterday's vegetables. I am something that's absolutely weightless, and you're something absolutely weightless. We are great programs of integrity, of a capability to support the integ integrity of eternally regenerative universe. And we're here for that purpose. And if we're not in support of the integrity of eternally regenerative universe by using our faculties to get gain local universe information to solve lo local universe problems, then we're going to f fail our exams. Mm -hmm. So the big story out, of, out here right now is we are living in an incredible mystery. And the more you learn, the more you know how little you know, and the more mysterious it all is. How come? How come the extraordinary integrity of eternal regenerative universe? And the more tiny you, uh, you are, but you realize you have some of that great mystery in you, and you've got to make it available to the others. Now, I would, I would say, I'm talking about a universe where we're going to realize for the first time what man thought of as physical is not physical. He made the mistake long ago of saying animate and inanimate, but both are physical. Animate was warm, soft, inanimate was cold, hard, stone. Alive and dead. So then, in, and we got into biology, and we began to discover within biology was something called chromosomes and, and control of design. We pursued that even further, and finally we got down in, into the virus and got into tobacco mosaic virus and virology in general. And there we found the DNA and RNA control. In that world, they're not just virologists, which is an entirely new kind of category, but they're nuclear physicists, mathematicians, biologists, geneticists. All of them so busy with excitement about this design control, they've not been taking inventory and talking to humanity about the fact that what we now call then the virus is, is also a crystal. It consists entirely of atoms and completely inanimate. What you and I, you consist physically of nothing but atoms, and atoms are inanimate. What is inanimate is clearer and clearer. What is animate is less and less clear. But we were all this time saying life is something in that anima, in the physical. Now we've learned by weighing people when they die that whatever life is, no weight is lost. And science says that anything that is physical is weighable, either electromagnetically or gravitationally. What I'm t trying to then bring about is clear, clarify anybody listening to us, that quite clearly now we know that whatever life is, is weightless is metaphysical, it's not a matter of animal and animal. The physical is completely inanimate. Mm -hmm. And anything about you and I that's physical, that's not life. You and I are 
using this telephone receiver, transceiver, but we're, we're not the tra telephone. Mm -hmm. After 83 years of life and being a free thinker, are you pleased with the evolution of man? Do you think that man is evolving properly? Are you happy about that? I, I'm astonished by it. I'm amazed in my life that the fact that we really are at the brink of success for all. In, in the brink of success for all. Then uh, there's just really... Physical, a, physical success. Physical success. Um, obviously, in your statement, you believe in life after life then. I told you I don't use the word belief anymore. I am convinced by the evidence. By the evidence. That, that life is not the physical. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we're all inherently immortal. I have talked to a lot of people, and I feel that I have spent one of the most inspirational hours of my entire life with you. And any part of me that was down or not sure has been reaffirmed and reassured by your presence. And I'm sure that I would tell you that in behalf of the entire audience that has watched this show. And I think all humanity is better for your life. Even though you might consider yourself a throwaway, your throwaway has given our seed hope. This is Psychic Phenomena. We have been in conversation with Buck Minister Fuller. May the force be with you, and you know it's with you when you realize you are the force. Till next week, God bless you. You are one fantastic man. Hello and welcome to Quest 4. My name is Jean Vance. Twenty years ago, Damien Simpson created a program called Psychic Phenomena, The World Beyond. It was a program that was so far ahead of its time that it was almost to the point of being radical. But many of the people that he brought into the foreground are now stars in the metaphysical world. Many of the people who came on that show who are absolutely unknown, but today are almost household words. Damien was so good at what he did, and he believed so greatly in this field. He believed in what he believed. He believed in the universal mind. He believed in spirituality. He believed that all people were one. He believed so many things, and so many of us feel that his work was so important that we truly must continue with his work. Damien's sudden transition was a shock to most of us. Uh, to all of us, it was a shock. But we also knew that we must go on, we must pick up the banner, and we will go ahead with all that he has dreamed of, he was the, Damien was the architect of the dream, and we are the builders. We want to continue on. We want to go with what he taught us, what he believed in, and what we believe in so dearly. Some of the shows you will be seeing are some of the shows that he did in the early 80s, and they are just as as up to date today as they were then, simply because they were so far ahead of their time in that period. The show was sold to New York, and it was such a hit that we just had letters coming in by thousands from people all across the country who were so pleased and so happy to find out that there were other people out there who felt and dreamed and believed the same that they did. Now we had to go on and change the name of the show, make it a different show, because it was sold. Now the show is called Quest for the Human Potential. It is still the same principle, still the same idea, 
still the same belief system, still this, the search for new ideas, still the imagination that goes into thinking and believing and stretching of your mind. We want to continue on, and we hope that you will continue on with us. Please stay tuned as we go forth with these shows. Thank you. You will not find much disagreement with the statement that a crisis condition currently exists on our planet, but our guest believes mankind can survive by understanding and responding to the threats we face today. We invite you to stay tuned for an extraordinary hour, for our guest is Buckminster Fuller. Mr. Fuller has gained recognition as an inventor, designer, philosopher, and poet, and is perhaps the best-known American thinker alive today. He is the creator of the geodesic dome and coined the term Spaceship Earth. Sometimes he's called the planet's friendliest genius. Mr. Fuller has been awarded 48 honorary doctoral degrees from universities throughout the United States and England, and, and he said that coincidentally he'd been around the world 48 times. He has written more than 22 books, and he has 115 major articles to his credit. His latest book is entitled Critical Path, and it has been described as a summary of human evolution. Welcome, sir, to the program. What prompted you to begin work on the critical path? Well, the crisis itself, plus a long pursued attempt to see how to solve problems with, not with politics, but with and guns, but with artifacts, ways in which we could alter the environment, physical environment, to make it more favorable for humanity, by virtue of which humanity could behave more favorably towards one another. So that, that <coughs> critical path, I got a very powerful feeling three years ago that I, didn't, I just had time to get this thing out before it might not be publishable anymore, when they, they might be burning books again. <laughs> You so, think it's that critical? I'm very much so. I think we're absolutely at the brink <laughs> at all times. The question really, in minutes, we have, I have a map of, my, of the world I'd like to show you rather sure. quickly. And this is the only map of the world in which you can see the whole world at once <coughs> without any <coughs> visible distortion of the relative shape or size of any of the parts. I have, it also, you can show it as one world island and one world ocean. So here, here it is, and it's a north and south world and not an east-west world of the old Mercator maps. So on this map, <coughs> I <coughs> show a hundred little white dots where the east is one percent of humanity, where, where humanity really is. For instance, there's 60 percent here in China and India, 34 percent in Africa and Europe, and only 12 percent over here in the Americas. So the most important thing about this is that there are now 50,000 atomic bombs poised ready for delivery. If, we, if that, they went off, if any, one of them goes off, there's a, a computerized retaliation and they'll all go off. And quite clearly, all humanity is all through just like that. So <clears throat> here we are, trembling on that brink with the, all kinds of different authorities who might be able to push such buttons. Question, how, how do we avoid do, doing it? Though? What, what can human, humans do themselves? You and I personally, we don't have any authority, do we? You don't know anybody has any authority. The president of the United States has authority here, but you don't know just what kind of council is going to move that man. Mm -hmm. You don't know how many other heads of states might push buttons. Anyway, what we can do about it is, is as far as I can see, number one is we are, we are I say, how and why were humans included in the universe? That's the next thing. <laughs> and, 
we were given, we are very extraordinary because <coughs> in consciousness thinks in all known other living creatures. All many creatures have brains, and brains are always coordinating the information of these senses. But we also were given minds, and human minds have the capability from time to time to discover relationships existing in the universe that are not in any way detectable by observing any one of the special cases. For instance, here we have this picture of the heavens. Kepler, extraordinary mathematician, astronomer, <coughs> back in, uh, made this extraordinary <coughs> exploration after Copernicus made clear that the Earth is going around the sun and not the sun going around us. <coughs> Kepler found that all the planets are different sizes, all different distances from the sun, all going around the sun at different rates, so seem to be very disorderly. But he said, as a mathematician, I know one thing, they're all going around the sun, so have one thing in common. If you can find something else in common, that's in trigonometry, you have two knowns, you may get somewhere. Mm -hmm. So he said, as a mathematician, I can give something else in common. I can give each one of those planets exactly the same increment of calendar time, right to the second. He knew that each, this, that each one was at the start. He made a line, a di diagram, the radius each one was from the sun. Then he had the, at the end of the 21 days, when the new radius was. He had the arc. So now he had the diagram, a triangular diagram, a long, thin one. He said, I might as well calculate these areas. He did so, and if you were kept at making that, found they, they were not similar areas, they were elegantly exactly the same mathematical areas. He said, obviously they coordinate. You can't come out, come out of the same number unless you're coordinating. He said, how can, they are millions of miles apart. If they're touching each other like gears, I can understand how they could coordinate. How can they coordinate at millions and millions of miles apart? Enormous things such as they are. So he said, obviously there's some kind of a tension operating. I have a weight on the string and move it around my head as an orbit, and they are going in orbits around the sun. They're also demonstrating elliptical orbits, and Apparently, there are times when these planets at different rates bunch more than other times, and they apparently pull, any, uh, the bunch pull on any one. So they bring about, you have, when you make ellipses, you have two restraints instead of a single restraint for circle drawing. So Kepler said, there is then this absolutely invisible tension capability operating, which comes out later on, Galileo makes experiments with fa falling bodies, rate of acceleration. Mm -hmm. Found they were accelerating at the second power of the arithmetical differences being traveled. And then Isaac Newton comes out with a theory that the interattraction of these celestial bodies was varying inversely as the second power of the arithmetical distance is intervening, which is to say, if you have the distance between the two, you increase the interattraction fourfold. Mm -hmm. This is proved to be then correct for what I'm getting at. A human mind has the capability to discover relationships existing between, which can only be mathematically expressed, then absolutely undetectable by our brains. So, Human minds, we, have made, we are here for some very special reason. To have been, been given access to some of the great principles of design of the universe itself. These principles, to qualify as a generalized principle in science, must have no exceptions. And that means, no exception means eternal. Our brain deals with the temporal, our minds deal with the eternal. That we have that capability means we must be designed to be here for something very important. But we were also designedly born always naked, absolutely inexperienced, therefore, no, no knowledge, absolutely ignorant, but given thirst and hunger and curiosity, procreative urge to drive us to make experiments, to take initiatives, to learn only by trial and error. We've been here all this time learning by trial and error, and I find we now come to the most extraordinary kind of an era where power structures have come into being. People who are stronger physically are able to overwhelm others, and they said, you must make no mistakes. We got our rules, and if you make mistakes, we're going to punish you which takes away from humanity the right to learn by trial and error. Anyway, they also then got to the point where they say, <coughs> we, are, we are supreme and we are <coughs> infallible, and we get to the point where we have power structure. The most important mistake we've ever made was to assume that the power structure was God instead of real God. Mm -hmm. and by real God, I don't mean a person, but I mean in, in the great intellectual mm -hmm. integrity governing all the great designing. We didn't design humans, we didn't design planet Earth, we didn't design uh, all the, uh, the two, two billion galaxies we now have discovered, we didn't design atoms, we, don't, we didn't design anything. But we have an ego that seems to feel if we don't solve the problems. So when you ask me about the crisis, I say, we're, our ego is in the way right now, we kind of think it's up to the 
politicians to solve it, and nothing could go worse than that. If we dumped all the machinery and technology we have into the ocean, within six months, humanity would die. If we dumped all the politicians all around the world in the ocean, everything would go along very nicely. <laughs> yeah. So our, our peril right now is one of those politicians being given his ego by the power, power structure, enormous money is being put up, for instance, just to buy the presidency today on, on yeah. television, yeah. costs 50 million, the senatorship 20 million, the representative 2 million, and so this uh, completely corruptible. We have now where the power structure is, uh, of the enormous money of the world is running affairs in, in the United States and, and much, much of, of Europe and so forth. So the question is, what can a little individual do? Well, number one, the little individual can dare to be absolutely truthful with himself. If you really recognize the kind of things I'm talking about and just uh, don't go wrong with the crowd about anything, but dare to really use our minds, where our minds know about the truth. If we dare go along with the real truths, we'll probably stay here. But otherwise, I think that we were included in the universe eventually to be local universe information gatherers, local universe problem solvers, in support of the integrity of an eternal regenerative universe. We may have been even introduced to, to test to see whether human, humans can mess up the, the universe. Uh, anyway, I think the invention humans are, are under examination. We're in final examination. And that's we as, as individuals really dare to go with the mind and dare to talk the truth and hold to it absolutely no matter what else comes along. We're, we're not going to stay here. Evolution is trying very hard to make all humanity one, one family, giving up all nations. That, that is uh, <clears throat> such a hope. Um, I think in the, in the book Critical Path, you point out the need to become uh, in all the different economies and, and uh, the different nations for there to be a realization of one humanity. Yeah. Uh, one, I guess it said, uh, to the you say, one planet, one people, please. Right. And that when we understand this. There's a very interesting thing that Christine Lund did on the Channel 7 News here about birthing and uh, instantly giving the baby to the mother, instantly and do not separate the baby, and it forms a binding between the two of them, and now they're changing their whole things. So maybe consciousness will come. We're going to find out in the next few minutes as we talk to Buckminster Fuller about the critical path and the hope for the future that I know lies within his heart and within his infinite mind. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to the program and to Buckminster Fuller. Mr. Fuller, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Thurber, the, the poet and the, the cartoonist, James Thurber. Yep. And he has a, a cartoon called The Last Flower, which is quite popular. Do you know it? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a picture of a flower, and it says, When all the world wars were over, all that was left was one flower and one man and one woman. And they got together, and they had a family, 
and then that family had family, and then they created industry, and then they created governments, and then they created armies, and then they had a war, and when it was all over, the last thing that was left was one flower, one man, and one woman. Is there anything in your studies or in your philosophies that points to the fact that this evolutionary process of the world is just one continual cycle of we are here, we are wiped out, a new group comes, and it is wiped out? Or do you believe that we are the group that will continue? No, I, I, would, I would see the final one flower and the couple, and all, everything's radiation around them, all through. Just like Mars or any other very barren planet. I think very much what I said to you, that we're here for some very important reason in the universe, not just to be a man and woman making babies and smelling flowers. We're, we're, we're here with these beautiful minds. That's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. Many, many creatures have brains. That's not what we're here for at all. So I, I then would like to know something that I find very, very important. When I was born, reality was everything you could see, smell, touch, and hear. They used to have an expression, I'm from Missouri, let me see it. Mm -hmm. And the year I was born, however, the x-ray was discovered. You couldn't see it. The same year I was born, Marconi discovered wireless. You couldn't see it. It did not come into play until I was 12 years of age. When I was three, the electron was discovered. It didn't make any newspaper. Nobody thought that's going to be anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Since that time, we've gone deeper and deeper into what we call the invisible reality. Where well, we discovered then that each of the chemical elements has its own electromagnetic spectrum, wavelength, and frequency. And we learned a great deal about the atoms and, and the, both macrocosmically and microcosmically. By learning principles of understanding refraction of light, we've been able to blink the lenses by which, which we have the telescopes to go into the microcosm and the macrocosm. So we have extended ourselves to the point where, when, in 19, when, uh, no, when I was 28, Hubble discovered another galaxy. Since that time, we've now discovered two billion more galaxies, over 100 billion stars each. The rate of increase of information is just absolutely enormous. So we're dealing then in this great invisible reality. And in the invisible reality, you begin to know how the atoms behave, by which our minds are in the principle, begin to be, understand a principle that's so simple, it's that of leverage. We have then a fulcrum and a lever, and you have to load, we come out one, you have what they call balance. Go out two increments, you have two to run can weigh out in under, under the great lever arm, and you have an 18 to 1 or 20 to 1. All machinery and technology gears are made with these principles of, of, of what you call advantage, mechanical advantage. Anyway, human beings with their minds uh, having access to these principles are now dealing in a great invisible reality where 99.999% of everything is going to affect our lives tomorrow is being conducted in the realms of reality, non contactable by the human senses. For this reason, the newspaper, the television, what we're doing here, the media can't get people to really understand. And, and people, the, we have what's called the power structure, and the power structure way, way back from the, just the big man, bigger than the others, has learned then to what uh, don't let two men come, big men come in one side, divide to conquer. <laughs> Keep conquered, keep divided. So the, the muscle people made all the brain people specialists. So we have all these specialists in the blind, invisible area. So this invisible man can't see what's going on in the other one. So today, society doesn't realize something that I undertook, which was seeing, I said, speaking about introducing artifacts which would control the environment. I learned, for instance, as you, you can, that the the Earth is not touching the moon, the moon is not touching the sun and so forth, yet we all held together this invisible gravity that, that Kepler discovered. And yet we were making all of our buildings brick on brick, compression to compression. I found out where the wire wheel was a great breakthrough. I said, I f can I find the principles? Sure enough, I've been able then to, to develop a structure which has, where none of the compression members touch one another. And you might say, well, what's going on here? I, I can't quite make it. It looks very complex. If you have a, a basketball and you put air in it and you push, put a little more air, it gets harder and harder. The air doesn't, the molecules of gas don't go to the center and they explode out of it. That would be vibrating. They go cascading around. They, they hit here, they hit here. They're trying to get out. They keep hitting the skin and, and coming around. Now, each one of these sticks you're looking at here 
is part of, of, that, of, that, of that pattern. I want you to think about two swimmers in a swimming tank starting from opposite ends and meeting in the middle of the tank, put their, doubling up their knees, put their shoes, feet against each other and shove off from each other. This is what engineering shows. Every action has a reaction. So each one of these sticks here represents a, a, a molecule of gas going this way with the reaction one going that way. They're trying to get out of the system. They're hitting not a vertical blow, 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 blow but a glancing blow. So this is then the model of the, what the uh, molecules of gas are doing inside the basketball. And this thing just bounces like, like the basketball. Now, I found out then how then to enclose space where we're dealing only in tension. The only thing that's continuous there is a little delicate, what you call, Dacron fiber, the kind you cleans your teeth with. It's being held together entirely in tension, like, as Kepler's will. So I found then, when you do that, you don't have to have, you, you can, don't have all these columns and, and beams. You have absolutely clear span of space, absolutely unlimited. By virtue of this, all the geodesic domes have, you can, uh, all the geodesic domes are, are made on this principle, and we'll find that they, I have them, there are now over 300,000 geodesic domes around the world, and their enclosing space was so little that with the, using the principles of, of doing more with less in the visible world, using the right alloys, we've been able to make it work. McCready made this beautiful cosmic albatross where a little man was able to pedal it, fly over the English Channel. None of the newspapers, none of the media has pointed out this is because the materials he used, this curve of doing more with less in the visible world, got to the point where, whereas steel has a tensile strength of 50,000 pounds per square inch, we have, he made this plane out of something called carbon fibers having 600,000 pounds of square inch tensile strength. This so much was so little. His plane, the wingspan was 45, was 95 feet, yet he was able, you could hold in one half 45 pounds. So I can tell you in the whole of technology and geodesic domes and, and all the invisible world, 1970 we crossed the threshold when engineering wise we can do so much with so little. We, took all the metals now going into the armaments and melted them up. We could, within 10 years, have all humanity living a higher standard of living than anybody's ever known. That is, we have four and a half billion billionaires, and we have to behave that kind of way. So I said, there is an out, but that has to come out of people having the courage to say, I don't, <coughs> I've never mind, I'm not familiar with that shape of, of, of how, I had went through years where people said, I don't want to live one of those geodesic domes. I want to have it look like a Cotswold Cottage or whatever it is, some nonsense. So our condition reflexes are, are what's against us. And so I say, this, can you and I and all the young people and older people too begin to say, I dare to go along with the fact that there's a better enclosure. It, so th those are, those are, the, the touch and go is uh, on the human, human integrity. I said, I said, bring me back then the idea we're in the final examination whether we're going to stay here on the planet on Earth or not. May I ask a question before we leave for the audience's sake? Is this the book that deals more with the technology that you're talking about? No, that leads to the, with all the geometries I've been giving you. Okay. There are two volumes of that. There's Syngex 1 and Syngex 2. Each one's about 700 volumes, pages. But uh, thank God, this, I find this book is proliferating very, very rapidly. Both of them are. Thank and God. this is more philosophy for human evolution, it, is it's, it not? It's about everything. It's about mm -hmm. Uh, speculative history of why we're here on the planet, the kind of thing they've been talking to you about. And yes, did today. Well, as I sit and listen to you, I understand how you got those 48 honorary doctorate degrees. I really understand that. I've always felt that inside of every man was a natural genius. If he'd shut his ears and his mouth for a while, he might get in tune with that natural genius. Obviously, you have. Uh, would you discuss... I'm, convi I'm convinced you're right that... Every, every human being is born genius. Mm -hmm. And the loving fear of the parents that the, when the child does dem demonstrates some of his genius and really being naive and exploring, they say, don't do that, Don, you're going to trouble the system. Mm -hmm. So we de de genius very rapidly. And, and luckily I got un, un de genius. <laughs> I deliberately said I must do so. Didn't you keep silence for quite a while? Or is, is that just a rumor that you were, a period of your life, you just had nothing to say and said nothing. I had realized we were all parrots, and I'd learned all kinds of cliches and all, just immediately somebody said this, I had to say, go skidoo, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. and my darling wife is with me here today, out looking at us, doing this. We, we, we'll have our 65th wedding anniversary in two weeks from now. Wow. And she was willing to let me for two weeks 
two, two years. She did, did the talking to everybody, had to be talked to, so I could be silent and get over my conditioned reflexes of stupid things to say. Well, as I said, in, as we said in the beginning of the show, that uh, is the most loving genius on this planet, and it would be an extraordinary hour. And uh, I value those two years of silence, and that was a great gift of your wife. And I'm sure she joins you in what you're sharing with our planet today. Mr. Fuller, God bless you. Thank you. Sir. God bless you, Don. And to all of our audience, see you next week. Stay in there. <laughs>